Thanks to Laura. Thank you so much, Joan. And good afternoon, everybody. I may begin by saying that I'm very, very excited to be sharing some ideas on what um, has been um, working for me and my students in this field that all teachers dove into without any warning or even warm up, and which is distance learning. And, um, and as I start sharing my screen and display, um, the slides I prepared for this presentation, let me say that I hope we continue having these types of webinars for a long time uh, where we all can share our best practices and uh, collaborate and le learn from each other. I, I feel very su supported at the same time because that's what this does. I decided to present on this topic so that more teachers can invest on utilizing online resources and platforms that are free and of easy access and use, as well as to show that preparing your own material shouldn't be as tedious and time consuming as we often experience. So I have two questions I'd like you to answer by typing in the chat box. Can we really take advantage of such resources and materials to develop and reinforce engagement in the distance learning process? And will students benefit with more dynamic online strategies? Please type yes or no, or Y or N, or IDK for I don't know, if you're not sure about it, to give me your opinion on this. I see a lot of yeses. Why, wow, yeah. Okay, good. We're in the same page. <laughs> Okay, everybody's saying yes. Okay, there's no no's or no I don't know. No? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, here we have a few bullet points. I think we need to consider when choosing or preparing the right materials to be used. And these are on the first place I put uh, students' attention span. What is it better? Long sessions and crowded materials can sometimes, or most of the time, discourage, overwhelm, or demotivate them. Besides, you know, some people have less of a um, attention span than others. Uh, in the second place, uh, time required for effective learning. I personally believe that meaningful learning can take place within minutes. As I said, we don't need to overwhelm students with too much information or practice. Students' self-confidence and self-esteem. Um, I think we need to take this into consideration when planning and preparing our lessons or activities. Even though I teach level four students, that doesn't mean they are all confident on their use of English. Next, I have time management, long le lectures, or assignments versus organized materials presented in chunks. Uh, please type in the chat box how you manage um, this. Do you prefer to have Google Meet sessions or Zoom sessions all the time for the amount of minutes or, or hours your class lasts or a combination of both? So what do you do? Yexica says once or twice a week for short amounts. Larry said both. Combina Jane, combination, but mostly live. Okay, any other input? Combination of both, daily. Larry says one hour a day on meet. Susan, we have two hour Zoom meetings twice a week. Trisha, daily two hour, hour Google Meets. Two hour, okay. Any other input? So I see that we all have different um, amount of hours that we devote to um, live sessions. Okay. And then uh, the last one is purpose for the material to be presented, um, which um, in turn will determine the, the learning outcome. Sorry, did I miss students' needs? Yes, <laughs> students' needs. Uh, for example, the majority of my students want to really improve their pronunciation and fluency, as well as their listening skills. 
So I will definitely emphasize on those while still integrating all the other areas they need to reinforce in order to achieve English proficiency. Um, as for ABE students, the objectives are more specific as to what I need to focus on for either math, writing, or technology. But also, I had to deal with situations where students needed to focus and, and review um, basic computer skills and basic internet use. So I would set aside any other objectives to help them feel comfortable with technology first. And now the last one, sorry, I skipped that the students need is the purpose for the material to be presented, which will determine the learning outcome. What is it that I want to accomplish by posting this material and creating and creating this activity? Um, purposeful and meaningful are two of my favorite words when preparing and selecting materials. So that's my guide for whatever level or class I am teaching. And also what I call the three M's. I don't know if that exists, but for me it's motivational, memorable, and meaningful. Those are my three M's. Any questions so far? Okay, let's move on. So uh, how do I know which platform will better suit my students' skills and needs? I have an ESL level four class, as I said, and I'm currently using with this group two main platforms, Google Classroom and WhatsApp. And you would ask, but why? Are you serious? And my answer to that is that the same way we design and adjust our lesson plans for face-to-face -face sessions, we also need to differentiate on how we reach students and how we provide, um, introduce, and have students operate each tool in such an easier, stress-free way of navigation instead of fostering frustration and, and confusion. I had to find ways to get new students who joined later or an entire ABE classes that were to be facilitated solely online to get engaged and producing an outcome. Besides the fact that they had to learn and adapt to a whole new world, which is computer based or even worse for some of them, cell phone based. Imagine having to deal with all this, um, turning assignments and documents and everything just by using a cell phone. Please type A for agree or D for disagree about this, feel, please also feel free to give your opinion on what I just said. A, Larry says agree. Yep. Um, is that, Joan, is that you're saying that I'm listed uh, twice? It's because I am. Yep. Um, I am I'm using my cell phone to check on the chat box so I don't have to right. worry about leaving the presentation as I read the comments on the I'm multitasking. Right. I'm multitasking. Um, someone uh, sorry Laura. Yeah, someone commented that they couldn't hear you and I know sometimes if you don't have it clicked for Laura presenting, you can't mm -hmm. hear. So that's just a little thing to note there. That's okay. all. Thanks. Thanks for the help. Jane says, agree, but not all students are familiar with WhatsApp, so there's a learning curve in both of these. Larry says, transition from traditional to online classes was different for students. Oh, very different. And David says, I excited, exited and entered again, and now I get okay. All right, so. <clears throat> um, where was I? Okay, so considering this need, I started sharing, um, I just listed here some differences of uh, Google Classroom and WhatsApp. Um, uh, this is the input I got from my students. According to them, Google Classroom is more organized, more formal, it gives them the sense of that the classrooms are, the classes are more formal, uh, the stream is easy to follow and it's more methodical for them. But you know, on the other side, they need, to have computer skills to, you know, navigate this uh, successfully. Now, uh, the students who use WhatsApp, they say it's easier to use, it's more practical, there's more interaction between all the members in the group chat, it's stress-free and also helps create and maintain a community. But some of the students also said on the other side that it, the, the stream is overwhelming and they sometimes get lost in all the 
assignments, links, and also um, they uh, use it to submit their the screenshots of their work there. So it sometimes is very overwhelming. <clears throat> So considering this need, I started sharing YouTube videos, uh, video links of tutorials on how to join a Google Classroom and how to turn in assignments. But there were still some um, students who would need a different approach and differentiated tutorials. And that's when I would start preparing five minute videos using Loom or Screencastify. And um, as well as uh, picture tutorials with screenshots I took using my smartphone with very, very brief, easy to follow steps. I have to say that I had to add myself as a student um, in some Google Classroom so I could have the same view and settings students had either by, by using a computer or a smartphone. Um, with this, my tutorials would perfectly match uh, with what they see on their side, and I would anticipate to the problems they might they might face when using a smartphone only for all the work required instead of a laptop or computer. So here you can see a screenshot of a video tutorial that I prepared to have students join a Google Meet session. I recorded uh, this using a Chrome extension called Loom. Is L O O M. And I can show you a um, little bit of it now. Hello there. I'm going to show you in this short video how to access Google Meet using your smartphone. I will access the Google Classroom app, which I downloaded previously, which is right here in the middle. Go to Medical Assistant. Click on it. And here I can see my last post where I shared the Google Meet uh, link. So what I'm going to do is click on it, click on the link that says class video meeting. You will see something like this. Um, an icon which says ask to join. And uh, in this case, I have join meeting because I created this meeting, so I don't have any permission to join. So you have to click on the and the part that says ask to join, to request permission to join. Okay, so I can grant it. So I'm gonna proceed and um, click join meeting. Uh, you will have to check if your cell phone's microphone and camera are on. These are located, like if you touch one time your screen, you will see three icons here at the bottom, okay? So you see, the first icon is the, mi the microphone. If you click on it, you can see this microphone off. If I click on it, I, I am allowing it to be used. The camera, the same thing. If I click on it, you can only be heard. You're not gonna be seen during the whole session. Hello there. I'm going to show Sorry, okay. I'm not gonna, I don't want to show you the whole thing, but um, what I want to show you with this is how the way I explain things is as if I'm actually showing them step by step. And what I found with this, uh, the difference I found with this is that um, using uh, YouTube tutorials already made, um, they sometimes speak too fast in these videos or they are just giving so much information is sometimes overwhelming, especially for ESOL students. They, that it's hard for them to keep up. They, they talk so fast and everything, they, they talk about so many things at the same time. So that's why I decided to do these differentiated tutorials where I would use the vocabulary that they would understand and very, as I said, very easy, brief, easy to follow steps. Okay. Um, you may choose between merging your webcam to, so that students can see your face uh, using this app, I decided to not do it so they could only focus on the steps to follow. This other tutorial video is on how to turn in an assignment in Google Classroom. And in this case, I, I use the extension called Screencastify. And I just wanted to try and see what the difference was between Screencastify and Loom. I downloaded or added 
to Chrome Screencastify to my Chromebook, my laptop, and Loom, I just use it for my phone. As I said, I needed to have different views. Like if a student was using um, a cell phone on only all the time, it would be pointless for me to send a tutorial using a laptop. You know, sometimes the settings and the positions of icons are different, and I had to consider all that. Let me say that both uh, Loom and Screencastify are very easy to install and use. I not only use them to record myself, um, but also to record any video or uh, audio that is not available for students. I also have a few students who have either limited data or limited computer or internet skills. So I would send the recording using either of these two tools. So I use them a lot. This is another tutorial on how to access the North Star. I mean, this is a screenshot. I'm not going to show you all the videos. On how to access the North Star assessment and online resources web pages, I use Screencastify for this one. Um, then I prepared this tutorial after a workforce co-worker told me she needed a tangible, more visual way of reaching students and their needs. This is presented in a Google Doc, which was printed for students and which has um, screenshots and clear, short instructions that could also be sent to their emails before they join um, a Google Classroom or, or in Google Meet sessions. Um, that way, visual learners could find instructions easier to follow. And it also helps those who are new to technology as a learning tool. So then why did I decide to use WhatsApp along with Google Classroom for my ESOL students? Thank God I turned into the queen of copy and paste and crop and send. <laughs> so my main concern was that those students who struggle with technology or would always need assistance no matter what would eventually drop out, especially during a time of uncertainty, lots of stress and fear. I really didn't want to add any extra stress or frustration to them. So they had to, the chance to pick which platform um, they felt more comfortable working with. I needed those students to keep engaged and above all safe and confident about their own skills and learning process. These are the apps I download, downloaded and use the most in my phone for teaching purposes. I literally have my classrooms at the reach of my fingertips. I copy and paste whatever I posted in the Google Classroom first into WhatsApp. And if I have something to announce or post uh, an assignment, comment, or give any type of immediate feedback to students, I can literally do it using my phone only. Uh, let me add that by downloading Google Docs, um, slides, and sheets. You can have um, easy access to students' work, and you can grade them using your phone. In my free time, I look for interesting and engaging games using this app right here, the Kahoot, and also extra practice in the Quizless app. I don't have Screencastify here because I use it only in my laptop, um, but I have Loom, as you can see here. Uh, I also use the Notes app a lot to scan literally anything. Uh, from textbook pages to printed materials and answer keys for students to compare their work. Um, you just have to keep the, the icon pressed with a finger and select here, scan document. And it works like taking a picture. You may choose between color or black and white scan, then you just click save and it's ready to be sent, posted, or shared anywhere from email to text to WhatsApp, and Google Classroom, and it saves a lot of time. I use it a lot. Now, with regards to online resources, going now to online resources and materials, I would choose short, interesting videos to catch their attention and keep them engaged. VOA English in a Minute offers a myriad of one minute videos presenting idioms and new expressions. My students really, really like this because they are expressions they would find in conversational English. After watching them, they would write a few sentences on their own using the expression presented. All of them are only one minute. I highly recommend this. Um, I also choose 15 to 30 minute podcasts following also 
focusing on the, also in conversational aspects of a language, uh, new expressions, and even, even grammar points and phonics. I tend to focus heavily on pronunciation, so I also use this one, Learn Out Loud, and Apple Podcasts. It has many, many, um, I don't know, podcast pages. Is that how you call them? Okay. Now, I use a lot of YouTube videos, but let me tell you, they sh should comply with certain parameters, like organized content. They should be brief. I, prepare, I prefer the closed caption option and charts especially for grammar, lots of visuals. Those are the, the things that I look for in um, YouTube video. Um, monotone speakers or lectures are out of my list. Even if the topic is interesting or straight to the point, like, no, that's out. Now, I present my lessons in chunks or parts or what you would call pre, during, and post activities. Um, as as a warm-up or pre-activity, I would post a question on Google Classroom, a Google form uh, for them to complete, for example, a mini census survey, also slides, short videos, and podcasts. We would have our Google Meet session to go over the material. Um, and um, I prepared also to clarify any doubts and go over the book we use, which is Future. I share on my screen the digital playbook um, and all uh, audio and video resources available on My English Lab. Uh, these resources are available for students after they create an account and join my course or class in this using this platform. So they could go over the listening activities as many times as they want at their own pace and they also have access to the digital flipbook in case I don't know they travel somewhere they forgot the books uh, somewhere or at the classroom um, they don't have access to the actual book they can go to their accounts and literally see the the digital flipbook there I have here a short video I want to show you how I am explaining something here using the flipbook so right now here in this very short uh, video it's, like it's gonna be a five minute video um your assignment for tomorrow we're still working on unit three community life what you're going to do is go to page 50 and 51. by the way we finished this today okay participle energies we went over the review and if you attended the online class we did the, um, the workbook that is only provided on google classroom you don't have that video books and i will be posting the answers uh for the ones who couldn't attend Okay, so once they join my class, I have, I have access to their work in progress. I can assign specific exercises for them to practice, and all the work they submit is corrected by this platform and also graded, which is awesome. I would typically assign exercises from this platform as extra practice and sometimes as an assessment. I usually go slow with lessons so that one specific lesson would take two to three days to be developed and internalized. Um, sorry, I skipped uh, the chat box. I see that um, some people are asking if this notes app is available on Android phones. And uh, I didn't know about this. Cheryl said notes is also on Android phones. How often does my class meet? Susan is asking. Um, they're meeting three times a week for Google Meet sessions, Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And at the beginning, I had double meetings, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, just because I wanted to accommodate those students who uh, had to help their kids with schoolwork. And that was very tough, but that's what I decided because I wanted, I really wanted students to keep engaged, you know. But now everything is kind of back to normal, let's say, and I just meet in the afternoon uh, for one hour each session. And they are always prepared with pre-activities for that live meet? Yes. So I would post um, the pre-activities exactly the day um, 
a day before, let's say I, we go over the pre activities, they go over the pre activities by themselves. And then the next day, we join the Google Meet session and we go over the during activities. Yeah, any other question? I wanted to ask one um, yeah. out loud instead of typing it in. So, do you, so, do they have a chance to ask questions about the live meeting before the live meeting? Like, I'm just thinking about the structure and how this would work with, if I was a student, I get the pre-activity, I can study it, I know that I'm going to be expected to practice dialogue or read something in a small group in the live meet, and I can text or message my teacher, you, like, asking any questions before that meeting? That yeah, absolutely, and that's why um, they, they find uh, Google Cloud, WhatsApp, uh, so very useful because um, they can just instantly have a um, type a question and I can answer right away. So yes, we use Google um, WhatsApp for that purpose. They also use Google Classroom, the more savvy tech you know, students use Google Classroom and they just comment under that, the pre-activities. The, the pre but uh, usually, um, most of them use WhatsApp just because it's easier and it's just in their cell phones. Any other question? Did I answer your question, Bonnie? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of it as a good strategy to help minimize chaos in a live meet because this whole video meet thing is new for many, many people. and. Um, knowing exactly what's going to happen before the meeting even starts sounds like a good way to minimize chaos. Yeah, that really uh, helped me have a structure so that students also see this structure and they know what to expect for, you know, the pre-activities, for the during activities and the post-activities. They already know, you know, how is it going to be, you know, working? How is it that we're going to be interacting? Hi there. I'm um, posting right no. now here. Nope. Not that. Okay. So um, for the post activities, as I said before, I prefer taking advantage of my English lab, um, North Star or, um, online resources, and um, which are really, really helpful. Then I have, I move on to the assessment practice. I use online quizzes a lot as well as online games and worksheets for writing assessments I prefer students to use email so pre would be the introduction of a content or the warm-up like I usually I would pick very uh, engaging interesting topics to catch their attention so in the pre activities they would say oh this is interesting I want to continue learning about this and then for the during is the, the actual development of the lesson practice and the post could be the review or assessment. The good thing about presenting activities in chunks is that students can see a linear style in each lesson. They can focus on each item presented one at a time, which the option to come back later and resume their work without losing track. They know what to expect and how to remain organized when performing at their own pace, which is very important now, right now with all the family responsibilities, school responsibility with kids and everything. So I find this very useful. Now, I want to share some samples of materials I use the most to assess students' performance. For AB students, I will either get online worksheets and copy and paste and edit them to my students' needs or learning purpose. Not everything that is online is helpful sometimes, so I need to adapt materials. So here you see I posted two links, these two, uh, for the sh for short videos on email etiquette. Okay, so that would be my pre-activities. I would, um, I, I found this on YouTube. And also two docs, two documents, uh, one with information, which is this one, and the other one with a multiple choice exercise. When I copy and paste material um, or information from the internet, I always cite the reference or website I used at, at the end. The main reason I do that uh, copying and pasting is that some websites are overcrowded 
with advertisement and hyperlinks, which number one are, are distracting, and number two, for students who are not that computer or internet savvy, it turns into the, into the frustration of opening unwanted extra tabs or web pages, causing them to lose track. Um, let me go to the next one. The post activity for this lesson is to send me an email following the tips presented in the email etiquette guide. In this case, students would tell me uh, how they were keeping up with assignments, how they were struggling with technology if they went, or how they liked or disliked the sessions on Google Meet. And in this way, I'm establishing rapport and getting feedback at the same time. Any questions so far? Joan, are you using more tools with students with more digital skills and students with less digital skills? I'm using the same tools with all of them, but just the, the way they um, work with them and the way they turn in assignments is the difference I want to talk about in a little bit. Any questions? You can unmute yourself if you have any questions. All right. Um, these are some online resources I use the most. Uh, for example, Quizlet. Um, Quizlet is great to review, assess, and help students with memorization. I also post questions about any material presented, like this one, uh, previously. In this sample, students had to write a sentence using any participial adjective from the video they watched before. Okay. Agenda Web is another one uh, with hundreds of interesting online quizzes and practices. You can select which level you prefer by clicking on the home button or on the three lines here, right here. So they have um, beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. So. Something I like about these online quizzes is that as students select the answers or type them, they are corrected by the website and get a score right away. Another online tool I use a lot is Kahoot. Not only AB students like it, but a, uh, I mean ESOL students like it, but AB students as well. There is plenty of content and topics you can choose from, and you may use uh, the games that are already available. Or you can also create your own games very easily. This is great to review vocabulary, grammar, or any content covered previously. These are samples of games I created. Um, health problems, internet basics, homophones. You can add pictures and select between multiple choice or true or false answers. You may also add a short video clip or music or recording if you want to make each slide of your game more engaging. You may select any game as a challenge, uh, which is open for three days. Here you can see the top five students in my class who score the most for this challenge on homophones. Let me tell you, they get very competitive with these challenges. They can also download the app in their phones if they want to have access to more games for their practice, but it's not necessary to do it. When participating in a challenge, they just need to click on the link I send to the WhatsApp chat or Google Classroom. These are also samples of games using uh, this website, godkidsgames.com. With this, students get the chance to either review or learn new vocabulary in a fun way. And you may ask, but Laura, how do your students submit their assignments if everything is online? <laughs> uh, well, they take screenshots of their results and send them to me via WhatsApp or post them on Google Classroom. Um, here you have, I use this a lot, these uh, website prop prof quizzes, and at the end they get a certificate that they can print actually, and here they can insert their names, they have their score, and what is the topic that they worked on. It's very cool. They really like this one, this uh, website. And then Quizlet, you can also see 
their score. So they just take a screenshot of the, the results, you know, their score, the results, not, not the whole process because sometimes it's a lot. And as I said, it overwhelms the stream in a WhatsApp group. So they just send the, the proof that they worked on it. Um, by the way, they told me how to edit a picture in their phones. I didn't know how to do that. They can add all the writing they want, emojis, or they can mark up their answers either by circling, underlining, or highlighting stuff. It really blew my mind how students figure out different ways to submit assignments. Like, look how cute this is. Changing all the colors, they can just, uh, you know, um, type using the T uh, icon in the, in the WhatsApp um, picture, the picture they have on WhatsApp. And they just can just adjust the size of, a, of what they type and then move it whatever they want it to be. Okay. They would send me answers as comments in the Google Classroom stream or take pictures of their work in their textbooks or notebooks and send them to me privately if they needed some individual feedback or to the WhatsApp group. In this case, I would post answer keys once I made sure everybody submitted their work. This is an example of when I use uh, the scan feature in my notes app. Mm. Yep, I take a scan of the answer key and post it right away on WhatsApp. It's easy, as easy as that. Like if I want to provide just the answer keys, I use the, the scan app, the notes scan app. Okay, um, here you can see that I learned how to send individualized corrections using the edit option once I open their screenshots. And you can choose the color you'll be using to correct, pen, marker, or highlighter style, as well as how dark or light you want it to be. And you can see here, the first time I started correcting these, you know, I, I was kind of struggling <laughs> with my handwriting, you, you know, with my, using my finger. But then when they told me how to do the, the typing and adding emoji, emojis, I was just all in, I'm gonna do it too. Okay, Bonnie, it is very important to recognize our students as valuable assets with things like this. I know my colleagues teach me tech tricks almost daily. Oh yeah, that's why I, I love this type of things, collaboration and learning from each other. Like, this is awesome. Um, they also stand their pronunciation and fluency practice by recording themselves with their smartphones or using the audio recording feature in WhatsApp for audio messages. This is something that saves time because I don't need to use Google Meet sessions to have them practice reading or pronunciation all the time, which for some students, is really, it really triggers them to be exposed or being listened by others when they have lack of self-confidence and so on. So I consider this tool very helpful, especially when the silent period lasts too long or they are just too introverted. They have a chance to do it when they are alone and feel ready for it. Um, let me click on this so that you can hear this sample. Hi, Laura. It is uh, 10 sentences for me. Last year, I visited my mom. I decided to take more time for studying English. In Russia, I worked as a psychologist about 10 years. When I was a teenager, I played in volleyball. Two years ago, I traveled, traveled in Italy. Our school closed since March. I finished cooking dinner one hour ago. Oops. Okay. So, um, in this case, they were practicing the pronunciation of the final ED in verbs in the simple past and which most of the students, ESOL students, find very difficult to do. So they had to pick of all the list of words, verbs that I sent, they had to pick 10 and uh, make sentences with those. Uh, the feedback I got from this type of assessment or practice was great. So I really suggest that you give it a try. Do you have any questions about any of these assessment samples so far? So that I can move on to 
the final part? Anyone? Oh, thank you, Larry. <laughs> All right. Wrapping up, I really believe we need to be purposeful on the time we are on the computer. And by saying we, I am including both teachers and students. It is important to create a routine, which in turn provides consistency to both parts, students and facilitators. And it also, it's also crucial to create and maintain a community. Um, I don't know if I have time to talk about this um, Facebook page. Do I, Joan? Because I really want to hear from other. Yep. Okay. Actually, I loved what you talked about that you were doing with Facebook. So um, yeah, my, my choice would be spend five minutes or so talking about it. Cause I, I think okay. you're doing something unique that I haven't heard other people doing. Okay, let me. Go here then. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I use Facebook merely as a social interaction platform, not for posting assignments or lessons. Uh, my purpose was to have students con connected. I wanted to hear from them and how they were doing and all the stuff I chose to post there was the intention to distract, entertain and build and or reinforce that community feeling they need to feel they are part of. I would post, as you can see here, positive encouraging material, funny videos, uh, Zumba videos. And we even had a challenge in which um, students had to post either pictures of themselves doing something specific um, or funny, you know, funny jokes or silly videos of themselves. Oh, this is this is uh, my kid and my husband uh, sharing a recipe of how to do homemade meatballs. I shared a recipe of, um, what is this, guacamole. <laughs> and this was a live video I made for the challenge. Um, let me see if I can find something else. So students would send, as I said, their videos. Watch this one. So they would come up with crazy ideas just to have some fun and and be part of a challenge. <laughs> and it's just, you know, the fact of disconnecting and from the reality for a little bit and just uh, stay connected, be part of this community. Okay, let me go back here. Any questions on this? About this Facebook? No assignments, no homework, nothing here. <laughs> you know, it's just for us to socialize. This is, um, it's just a Facebook account I created using an extra email I had. I know I can have um, a group within my account, but I didn't want to do that because, you know, it's, when, when you turn, um, you know, a lot of things, especially from work, into your cell phone, then your cell phone turns into a work tool. And... I didn't want to do that because I already did it with the Google Classrooms and all the stuff, WhatsApp and everything. I didn't want to do my Facebook also, like my workspace. That's my reason why. Did all students like the Facebook idea? Yes, they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. A virtual version of the hallway on coffee break. Oh, I like that. Yes. Also, it is public, secret, closed. Christina's asking is just for us, just for me and my students. Just us. Uh, Bunny was the only one who was invited so that she could see uh, what we were doing in this Facebook page. It's not so. Yes. When you set it up, did you set it up as a closed group or is it a secret group? It's not a group. It's a, a Facebook account. So I can manage, you know, who's joining and who can see. Like my posts are like, cannot be seen by other people, like friends of friends, you know. Oh, so it's not a group. It's a, it's like a quote unquote person with privacy settings on high. Exactly. Just because okay. I do want to have a 
subgroup in my personal Facebook just to give it a feel that it's not work again. <laughs> Another app where there's work again. You know, yes, it is a Facebook page. Any other questions? Uh, can I assume that the group is not allowed to, say, invite other people in or anything like that? No. No, they can't. I'm the only one who can um, admit um, and confirm friends, friends' requests or send those requests to my students. Any other question? Okay. I'm, 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 I happen to be, I'm just wondering if other people are actually using a Facebook page for socializing, for socializing. Just curious. That's a good question. Can I just ask you, how often do you use this Facebook page with your students? Um, yeah, sure. I started using it like um, every other day. Oh, wow. yeah, especially when you know there was like this time that of uncertainty uncertainty and everybody was just freaking out like what is going to happen to the world and what's going to happen to us so that i could get more feedback more connection with them more often and then i would eventually just post once a week okay thank you you're, you're welcome i also tried um playing kahoot live games uh with using this tool facebook but i don't recommend that it was a little complicated to make it live because I had to use two, what's it called, two devices. You know what I mean? That's why I recommend just doing the challenges on Kahoot and just posting the link and they can play at their own pace at their own time, not just everybody at the same time. Okay, I hope you found some good resources in this presentation and also some tips that will definitely help you deal with distance learning with a different approach. Now, oops, I'm not presenting this. I'm so sorry. Um, now, after listening to this presentation, could you answer again these questions I asked at the beginning? Do you have the same answers now? If you weren't sure, do your answers turn into a yes? I remember everybody said yes. But if you have anything to say, can I have some feedback by getting any comments from you? I have a question about the combination of, you know, uh, internet resources and self-made resources personalized for your class. Mm -hmm. If you had to uh, just take like a initial guess, what, what percentage of pre-made versus tailored work like resources do you use? Is it like 50, 50 mm -hmm. or is it like a minor amount of like adjustment to resources that you find on the internet? What do you think? Yeah, never thought of that, but now that you're asking, that's a good question because I never realized how much I use online resources. I use online resources the most and I've been doing it for, well, personally for eight years now that I'm using uh, YouTube videos, for example. Like once I found them, I'm, I, I got obsessed and that's why I have a lot of, you know, ideas on where to find, where to, look for stuff and how to find them and which sites, which YouTube, um, I don't know how you call them, pages, um, are really useful for what specifically I'm looking for. So I would say um, maybe 70% of online resources and 30% of um, my own materials that I create according to, as I said, my students' needs, or if I want to differentiate in certain areas, you know, or skills. So it all depends, but definitely, definitely a lot more online resources. Do you do you have to pay for any of these resources that you're using? All them, no, all of them are free. All yeah. of them. That's why I wanted to share with you all. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll, I'll just add as a caveat to that, it, it's all free to Laura, but the futures book, Genesis Center Buys, so the online resources that go with that are paid. It's a Pearson product. And so if you buy the futures book, I think all of them, futures, ventures, stand out, they all have some sort of online component that you could talk to your agency about. But 
once you have it, there's a digital flip book, there's online um, recordings for the dictations and all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah, I really like this um, material we're using at Genesis Center. Um, I'm not going to give free advertisement, but it really, really makes my work easier, you know? Yes, Jessica. Um, can you hear me? Yes. My question, I know that with your ESOL classes, you have used Google Classroom since the beginning of classes when we were still in the building. But how is it? How was the transition to those students that you have that are new, like the CNA classes and all that? Did they already know they were going to use Google Classroom? Is that why you did the video for them? Yes, they already knew. And um, I mean, we contacted them via email and sent these uh, tutorials, either video tutorials or the, um, the one that is uh, a doc with the screenshots so that they would you know, follow the steps sent to their to their email, and then eventually, if they had any any problem, um, as they go, you know, as they use those uh, tools, they would just contact me through email or yeah, email mainly. That's uh, that's a group. The AB students who started only merely online, uh, those were the groups that I I think had more trouble because. Um, you know, they had to start this whole thing only uh, through distance learning. So it's a big of a change for people who never did that before. So as I said, it was a big challenge and that's why I, I felt the need to prepare these materials and these tutorials. And I, I can say that they really, really, really helped me and them. Any other things? You're welcome. Any other feedback or comments? Did I talk too much? <laughs> All right. This is my email, laugp77 at gmail.com. And um, I will be more than glad to share more with you. This was kind of like, um, as I was talking to um, Joan before this, uh, she said, oh, make sure you put everything into one hour. And I was like, I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> so if you ever need um, any more explanation or ideas or of how certain websites work or how certain platforms work, I will be more than glad to be in contact with you. So please email me and you know, I love, you know, everybody knows that I love, love, love to collaborate and share with teachers. That's one of my passions besides teaching. And you bring up a great point too, that you know, if, if people are looking at something and thinking, I need more information, they can certainly reach out to you. They can let me know. They can let Sherry at the Tech Hub know. Because what we're, you know, I think what we're all trying to do is collaborate and figure out ways that, you know, everyone can use what they want to be using. Um, and have the support to actually do that. So, very interesting, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> really Thank appreciate you. all that you put into this today. It was it was great. Thank you so so much. And anytime, I'm more than glad to be keeping contact with all of you. And mm -hmm. I see you got some applause. Yay! You can't always see it, but it's happening. <laughs> It's happening in words too. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're a celebrity. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> hey, support is a good thing. There should never be too little oh. of that. It should always be out there. That's true. That's true. And so thank you I all for joining today too. This is great. Lots of good questions for sure. I'll hang right. into the end with you just in case people have a final thought, but yeah, of sounds great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank so you, Laura. Much. It was excellent. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining. Bye. <laughs>
Sounds I'm good. I'm, I'm going to go in and stop the recording because I don't think there'll be anything crucial from this point on. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> You're welcome.